Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. So the other night, my family and I sat down for movie night. This is something you've probably done a hundred times. You flip around through all the streaming choices, you land on a movie that you've maybe heard good things about but haven't seen, then you try and convince the children (laughs) that they want to watch it. Anyway, that night, we all watched a movie called Wolf Walkers. It is a stunningly beautiful animated film. Cell animated, not 3D computer animated. It looks almost like a woodblock print. It's set in Ireland in the 17th century. The English have control over the country, and in the town of Kilkenny, the Crown is looking to cull the local wolf population. The movie's protagonist is Robin. She's moved to Kilkenny with her father, who's been charged with exterminating the wolves. Robin wades into a world of conflicts, cities encroaching on forests, English Christian values clashing with Celtic traditions, colonizers, and the colonized. And between these two worlds, Robin discovers something magical, a group of people who can turn into wolves. The film is directed by Ross Stewart and Tom Moore. Tom is the co-founder of Cartoon Saloon, an Academy Award-winning animation studio in Ireland. His previous two films, Song of the Sea and The Secret of Kells, are also spectacularly beautiful. And like Wolfwalkers, their stories and images are steeped in Irish folklore. Anyway, The Guardian called Wolfwalkers a masterpiece that feels right to me. Here's a clip from early on in the film. In this scene, Robin is exploring the woods outside the walls of the city. She meets a girl who lives with the wolves named Maeve. Maeve has the ability to turn her spirit into a wolf when she sleeps. This scene takes place after Maeve rescues Robin from a violent encounter with the wolves. Saved me. You bit me. Well, you kicked me in the gob enough times. Well, you were attacking me. I was trying to get you out of that trap. And anyway, you came into my woods. Your woods? They're our woods. Your wolves are attacking the woodcutters and the sheep. They should be staying closer to the town. And so should you, townie. Tom Moore, Ross Stewart, welcome to Bullseye. I am so happy to have you on the show. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us here. So I guess like... This is a very broad question, but it's basically like, where do you get off? Like, how did you get the idea that you could start an animation studio and make feature films? It was just, uh, it was just a youthful ambition, naivety, and sort of, I don't know, stupidity. I feel like that list of things would justify starting a studio that like makes animation for television commercials or something. But like feature films is really next level commitment. Yeah, I think I was very inspired when I was in college um, by Richard Williams, who had spent like 25 years in London making commercials so he could work on his feature film on the side. And I saw a documentary about him and he was so passionate that like animation could be a, an art form. And so I think there was a gang of us that were quite earnest as well, that we just felt that we could, if we had a studio, we could make our own projects and sort of see if we could push the art form. So it was that, yeah, it was, we were lucky as well, like that it kept going and the things aligned that we were able to have a studio in like the Midlands of Ireland in the 19th, late, early 2000s, I suppose. Um, Yeah, it was just a confluence of good luck as well, but yeah, we never thought about it as being crazy ambitious. I think we just saw ourselves as kind of, um, an extension of what we'd been as teenagers making, you know, making our own movies with young Irish filmmakers here in Kilkenny, you know. Was feature films always the idea? Yeah, we had a, we set up the studio at the start, literally with a Dick Williams type business plan where we thought we would spend half the week doing whatever it took to pay the bills and the rest of the week making our, making our feature film. And that's it was how naive it was, you know. I mean, what's, Interesting about that business plan is that it contains the supposition that you're you can make double money in half the week. No, we we lived on we lived on uh, we lived on beans and toast. Ross will tell you, like Ross had to build the desks of for our studio for so we'd have desks to work on. And it wasn't like we were making a lot of money. It was just sort of like we were willing to 
extend that college art college experience a bit like we did think we could make a feature in a year or two and then go and get real jobs but it just ended up snowballing you know yeah i wonder if if people had told us like how long how long it would take to make the movie and 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 all the pitfalls and everything i wonder if we would have dived in with such kind of naively but um yeah like i think also the fact that as you mentioned young irish filmmakers gave us this kind of can-do attitude like we if we we wanted to make a comic so we just said all right let's just make a comic um you know like you could just go out and shoot a film uh with the camera whenever you wanted so there was this kind of like just fly by the seat of your pants kind of approach that we had learned in young irish filmmakers and i think it just carried through because we set up the, like cartoon saloon in the the grounds in the same building as young irish filmmakers so i don't know that that kind of aura was infectious when i was a kid i would go every year or actually i think twice a year to see this thing called the spike and mike festival of animation it would come to the to the roxy theater by my house in san francisco we'd go see it and um i you know, Spike came on this show when I was still in college and he's just like a grisly old punk rock guy with like a sidekick who was a, who was like a crust punk, um, who was like 20 (laughs) (laughs) and they just barnstormed these compilations of independent animated films. Yeah. But you know, like it was one of the highlights of my childhood every time, every time it rolled through town. And I wonder if you guys, as kids in Ireland, had the opportunity to see stuff like that, especially at the movie theaters, but even on television. Yeah, Channel 4. When, we, when I was a kid, I didn't have all the channels, but the British Channel, Channel 4, had a late night thing called um, Formations. And they would just show crazy animation from all around the world. And that was like an education. And then, like... Uh, going back to Young Irish Filmmakers, when I joined Young Irish Filmmakers, some of the older kids there were already going to like film school and they would have passed around VHS tapes of like interesting, crazy, you know, Jan Schwankmeyer shorts. And, you know, so we saw some of those kind of more obscure things through hanging out with some older kids who were into like nerdy things like that. It was it was really only like in our teenage years when it kind of opened up, wasn't it, Tom? Because yeah. I, I don't know, like for any American listeners, they might not know. But in, in Ireland, when we were kids, there was literally two channels and yeah. like the programming would only start sometimes at lunchtime. And they had such a low budget, they would show these Eastern European uh, yeah. cartoons of just like abstract shapes chasing each other around because that's <laughs> all they could afford. Do you remember there was a guy, Fufu guy? Oh God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like literally, just because it was animated, you would watch it as a kid. Yeah. Just because it didn't like it didn't matter that it was so obscure and so random and everything. You would just watch it because it was a cartoon. Oh, there were like analogies again against <laughs> like the Eastern Bloc trying to get free of communism and stuff, but it went over our heads because it was just a car- like a weird abstract cartoon. But I kind of I kind of love that we saw all that stuff because we weren't completely under the illusion that everything was Disney. You know, I did yeah. way, way, way prefer like Don Bluth Disney cartoons if I could get them, but I kind of watched anything really. Yeah, and there was there was one time that like um we only had the two channels and we discovered that if if we got the aerial on our roof <laughs> and pointed it in a certain direction that we might get pick up like S4C from Wales. And then it would be in Welsh. Yeah, right. It would be in Welsh and the reception would be so bad. And if the wind blew, it would go all staticky. But you could just barely make out a cartoon. And the excitement of it. (laughs) Yeah, you'd watch this static, hissy thing in Welsh just because it was a cartoon. (laughs) Super Ted. Super Ted in Welsh. There was like a Welsh cartoon about a superhero teddy bear. I remember watching through the static going, wow, signals from another civilization. Wales. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I mean, I imagine that if you grow up speaking English, that watching anything in Welsh feels like a broadcast from an alien planet. Welsh is such a language. That's that's true. That's true. That's true. Was even the things that that you were watching in English or was some of it in Irish? Yeah, some stuff was in Irish. There was like Irish language versions, which were kind kind of strange, like of like Batman, the animated series and stuff. And when I think about that, that's kind of mad because it was like Gotham City, quintessentially New York, but everyone spoke Irish with like West of Ireland fisherman accents. But yeah, 
when I think about it, SpongeBob was in Irish when it came out too. Obviously, I was already in college when that happened, but I remember my son, he went to an all Irish week in school. So some of our cartoons were some of the first cartoons that were actually Irish cartoons made in Irish for an Irish speaking you know, channel. So yeah, that was the third channel. We had a third channel eventually, and that was all Irish language. And they had some good, but good cartoons. We were already teenagers by that point, though. Yeah, yeah, they had some good cartoons. Yeah, the the little weird cartoons that we saw with the shapes chasing each other around. They didn't even speak uh, a language. They just made little sound effects. <laughs> oh, but do you remember the Max Buds? The Max Buds. And there was some Irish cartoons. They were really basic. They were like kind of cut out like illustrations as well. So, yeah. And Gregory Gronjog, which was a hedgehog made out of plastic. Mm-hmm. Anyway, why are we talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> so your films, uh, uh, you've made this series of films about Irish folklore. And what was your relationship with like, you know, Irish folk culture when you were a kid and also just kind of identity uh, irish identity um what, what did what did that mean to you it was less con- it was less conscious as a kid but like my parents were um from northern ireland and i spent a bit of time in northern ireland and it was like a point of pride for my uncles and aunts to learn irish and wear a little fonya to show that they were irish and it was also a signal in northern ireland that you were on the kind of um Irish nationalist side of the divide, you know. So there was a, a political element to it that I wasn't conscious of as a kid. But then there was another aspect of it that I think there was like things like 10 Minute Tales, which was like Eddie Lennon, who was a storyteller. And he was literally just like a man sitting in a chair telling stories on TV. But I used to really love those just as much as the cartoons and stuff. So thinking back on it, there was a consciousness, but it was honestly, I think I way preferred American stuff. I thought it was mm. cool. Japanese and American cartoons were really cool. And I kind of aspired to be like an American kid more than an Irish kid when I was really young. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I started to have any kind of sense of being proud of being Irish or being interested in what was different about Irish culture from, you know. Even uh, I'd say like a late teenager, because I think like as an Irish, Irish children are generally forced to learn Irish. They're forced to learn about myths and legends. They're forced to learn about a lot of stuff that is Irish. And so you kind of resent that when you're when you're forced to learn anything. And I think then when we were kids, we looked up to everything American, to everything from the UK, like because it was foreign, it was new and exciting. And then. And then slowly, as you get to like your late teens and into your early 20s, you start to realize that the, the things like the things that you value about maybe your own culture uh, and you don't resent them anymore because you're not forced to learn it. So I remember getting really interested in myths and legends um, again when I was about 20 and 21 and I started learning Irish traditional music. I started learning, re- relearning Irish again. And I don't know, it wasn't from a patriotic point of view, but it was just that I found a lot more meaning in it and and I think um I found a sense of self that identified with uh these things that I maybe had been forced to learn as a child I I had a, a renewed a, a excitement about them I think I was a bit younger because I remember being about 14 or 15 and again going back to young Irish filmmakers again there was um a whole series in the comics so I loved American comics and it was about Superman and he was going to die and come back to life and all and the guy who ran Young Irish Filmmaker started talking to me about the whole idea of the monomyth and Joseph Campbell. And there was a VHS tape there of interviews with Joseph Campbell. And I thought that was really interesting. And I remember at the time starting to look again at like American uh, mythology that I'd grown up with, like Star Wars and superheroes, and then seeing how they had treads that went back to European mythology and even in particular Irish mythology. And there was this guy called Jim Fitzpatrick who used to make these like picture books that were almost like superhero style renderings of Irish mythology and all the characters from Irish myth were kind of drawn as kind of badass rock stars and like all the goddesses were like sexy 80s 90s style girls and stuff but he would do all the filigree in a book of Kel style all around the edges and I remember really loving those books and thinking they were cool and there was a comic called Slania, which was about like an Irish uh, kind of ancient Irish warrior. It was kind of a rip off of Cú Cullen and other Irish. Stuff. And I and the painting in it was amazing. It was a guy called Simon Bisley. And it was real like 
Kerrang kind of heavy metal cool version of Irish mythology so at that that was the stuff I liked if I liked anything and I was a bit of a strange geek who liked things like Clannad and Enya and stuff music wise <laughs> yeah I think there's the list of uh, uh the list of like teenage Enya fans is a relatively short one yeah yeah I was definitely <laughs> I got told by I got told by my school friends that the only people who owned Enya albums were uh, people whose grandmothers had bought it for them accidentally thinking it was something cool that young people would listen to and yet oh poor Enya I loved poor Enya I loved Enya you loved her cheekbones I remember in particular I thought she was just the most beautiful Irish goddess <laughs> Ross, what do you think changed when you became an adult that you actually started to be interested in it? I mean, I'm looking at you over a sort of slightly sketchy internet connection, and over your shoulder there is a, a musical instrument that I cannot identify, uh, but looks like something you'd used to... Oh, it's a mandolin. Oh, is it a mandolin? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a mandolin. Um yeah, um, but no, what I, what I, uh, what I play normally is is like uh, tin whistle and bazooki. Bazooki is like a larger uh, instrument than a mandolin, and it's like a, it originally came from Greece, but it's used a lot in traditional music now. And I got the mandolin last Christmas to to learn something smaller, and the frets are too small for my fingers. I have these two chubby fingers that won't fit inside these frets, so that's why it's hanging up on the wall because I can't play it with my big sausage fingers. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the, the thing that changed in me was, um, I think like, I think it probably would have been there if it wasn't forced on me, you know, like I went to an Irish language college for a year in between primary and secondary school at the age of 11. And that was a quite an austere college. Um, and it was in a Gaeltacht area and you were punished if you were caught speaking English, you know, it was that kind of place. And, and also it was the kind of place that had corporal punishment. Like every Friday, there would be a line of kids waiting outside the headmaster's office to, to like get beaten, you know, with a stick. So this was this was like a year or two after corporal punishment was actually banned in Ireland. And this still kept it going in this in this college. I won't keeping name the it traditions alive, keeping the traditions <laughs> alive. <laughs> I won't name it in case I get sued. But uh, but yeah, they um. They like so with that kind of atmosphere, you could understand how kids would come out of that going, "Oh man, I don't ever want to speak Irish again," <laughs> because you associated with all these bad memories. So I think I probably would have had a love for it if it wasn't, you know, taught to us in that in that same way. But then I don't know. I think like because we were, as I was saying, the even the the, the TV channels that we had was so limited. The exposure to comics was so limited. The exposure to everything was so limited because, you know, we were in a small town in, in rural Ireland. So any little glimpse or of, of like American culture, you would like grasp and hold on to and go, wow, this is something so new and so different. And it's and it's really special. Um, and that's why I'm kind of jealous of like kids nowadays where you can just go on the Internet. You can see anything all across the world instantly. Like we were the exact opposite of that. We were very, very uh, closeted. Yeah. And so so with with anything American or anything foreign being so interesting, you kind of naturally shelve everything Irish as being like, oh, it's so boring and it's so like, you know, passe and conservative. Uh, and so I think it, it, it took me until my my probably my adult years to real to kind of flip that on its head and realize that actually Irish culture had a lot of depth and maybe, you know, just because something was American, it wasn't automatically cool. You know, I started learning about like, you know, America's kind of, uh, you know, like the, the kind of the bad points of American history as well as the good. I used to look up to to that culture without really knowing, you know, that within every culture there's good and bad sides, you know. So I think I think it just came with maturity that I, I started to realize, you know. Do you think, Ross, that there was a part of it was the Celtic Tiger? Because I feel like we graduated out of college in the late 90s early 2000s and the country was riding high and I feel like like my son was quite young at the time and I feel he grew up in a different Ireland that had a different attitude to itself you know that there was you know the the Irish language schools are out going you know there was just a, a pride that had come back and I think in the 80s 
Ireland was kind of depressed. Everyone was emigrating to England or America or Australia. And I think there was just a sense that it was it belonged to like, I don't know, the Civil War or something. Um, this kind of nationalism or this kind of, you know, so you wanted to move past it. And it kind of got reinvented a bit. Like when I think about the Irish movies and stuff from that period, I feel like things started to become more positive rather than just always focusing on the church and the English and all the bad stuff, you know. We'll have even more with Ross Stewart and Tom Moore coming up. After the break, we'll talk about the animated films that inspired them. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. This message comes from NPR's sponsor, NerdWallet, a personal finance website and app that helps people make smarter money moves. Have new money goals this year? Whether you want to use credit card points to plan a family vacation abroad once it's safe or take advantage of low mortgage rates to refinance and save for your child's education, NerdWallet is the best place to shop financial products to make your 2021 money goals happen. Discover and compare the smartest credit cards, mortgage lenders, and more at nerdwallet.com. Maximum Fun is a network by and for cool, popular people. But did you know it also has an offering designed to appeal to nerds? A show for nerds? On Maximum Fun? The devil, you say? It's true. It's called The Greatest Generation, and they review episodes of a television program for nerds called Star Trek. They've reviewed TNG, DS9, and are now reviewing Voyager. Hey, Star Trek. My daughter enjoys that program. Well, if she enjoys that, and she enjoys humor of the flatulent variety, might I recommend she subscribe to The Greatest Generation? Hey, are you calling my kid a nerd? Why, I ought to... Well, gotta go! Become a friend of DeSoto by subscribing to The Greatest Generation on MaximumFun.org today! The news is about more than what just happened. You need to know why it happened, who made it happen, how it's felt in the communities you care about. NPR's daily news podcast, Consider This, gives you all of that, with context, backstory, and analysis on a single topic every weekday. It's not just information, it's what the news means. Consider This from NPR. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. If you're just joining us, my guests are animators Ross Stewart and Tom Moore, Their new film, Wolf Walkers, is set in early modern Ireland. It's a film steeped in folklore about colonialism and our relationship with nature. It is also spectacularly beautiful and very exciting. I can't recommend it highly enough. Tom Moore, the co-director, also co-founded the animation studio Cartoon Saloon and directed the Academy Award-nominated movies Song of the Sea and Secret of Kells. Let's get back into it. Were there any sequences or moments in big hand-drawn animated films, the Bluth movies or uh, Disney movies that made an impact on you that that you think about? Yeah, when I was a kid, I went to a a birthday party in um, a friend's house and they they put on uh, The Secret of Nim for for his younger sister and her friends to kind of keep them out of the way. And we were all being like, we were ever eight or nine or whatever. So we were a bit cooler. And I, I was just mesmerized. I watched a bit where she goes into the owl, you know, she goes in through the kind of, um, it's like a cave, but it's just a tree. And she's going into the owl and there's cobwebs and the owl's eyes was glowing. And I was just blown away by that. I remember turning around and some of my older friends were like, oh, he's watching cartoons with the babies. But I just loved that. And I remember, I always remembered being pretty terrified of it and thinking it was amazingly like, it was another it was like something that I hadn't really seen because it had all the bells and whistles and I was used to like a lot cheaper kind of TV animation or check shorts or something like that so I hadn't really seen anything like that and even the Disney cartoons at the time they were really cool like I love them now but I, I remember thinking seeing stuff like Robin Hood and the Jungle Book and all it was very you know paired back where the Bluth movie and particularly that sequence in Secret of Nim was like you know glowing eyes lots of sparkles lots of special effects and light and shade and everything and for a kid that was just like what what is this yeah Robin Hood was the first uh first film I ever saw in the in the cinema and I think I went with my par- with my parents maybe but yeah like the Jungle Book and and that era the 101 Dalmatians and that that era I think is uh, was always so impressive and the funnily enough like we we looked at that for for wolf walkers inspiration as well and it still is so impressive like it just has this kind of timeless beauty to it 
uh, that like you know it was beautiful back then when it was first released and now like whatever 50 years later it's still beautiful probably 100 years it'll still be you know i think they're really tasteful when i look at them now i can see like the aristocats and 101 dalmatians and that whole era were were kind of like they were quite designy compared to other disney movies and where bluth was trying to go back to the kind of rococo production values of pinocchio and stuff the that era i way prefer now and when i when like, i loved them as a kid but um, I think they, they stand the test of time because they just rely on some really good kind of graphic design almost. Yeah, I think I feel like people associate modernism with a kind of coldness. But I think those Disney movies are more modern in their aesthetics, but also in the service of warmth in a really yeah. like Robin Hood and the Jungle Book are two of the most like pleasant worlds to be in of any of those mm. Disney films. I think the character animation was the main point of them as well. Like they were designed, especially 101 Dalmatians, like it's beautifully designed and it has a story, but their stories are more like a little hook for lots of great character moments. It was just like, a you know, a sequence of cool character moments. And the plot was like a, a hook to allow the animators to go crazy in the design, especially 101 Dalmatians. I mean, that is so stylish, so classy and kind of effortlessly. And I guess the guys were at the top of their game, but they were still young enough to be kind of influenced by what was going on with Saul Bass and UPA and everything, you know. Yeah, the concept artwork for, for 101 Dalmatians is especially beautiful. It has this lovely kind of jazzy feel to it. But I'd say the Jungle Book um, story was more uh, just a sequence of events yeah. that just allowed some great character events. That's it, yeah. Like like the story of 101 Dalmatians at least had it's, like, you yeah. know, a, a definite plot and def- a climax and yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> Jungle Book when you watch it now, it's like that's why I think it's such a perfect stoner movie because it's just you're just drifting along and just like meeting these characters, these great songs and then it's like, hey, it's finished now. And that's it's not nice. going to wreck your head like Fantasia because you're like watching yeah. Fantasia especially if you're watching it as a stoner kid and you're like, this is cool. And then all of a sudden you get into all this f-ing night on Bald Mountain and it gets really scary and you're like, oh no, man. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I ask about your relationship with Irishness Besides that Wolf Walkers is is the third film from your studio that's based in Irish folklore, is that Wolf Walkers is a story about English occupation. Was it always going to be a story about English occupation? Yeah, I think the two basic ideas that we came up with, and we had a very short story meeting to come up with it, where we wanted to explore, you know, the species destruction that's coming with that kind of attitude that you can just wipe out a species in order to tame the country so that was really the like it was the core like i think i think the two ideas of using the wolves of ossery and speaking about the 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 effect that the cromwellian invasion had on irish culture by changing the landscape and the species so drastically i think that was would you say ross that was really at the start yeah, definitely. I think like we were looking at, you know, like uh, the perfect kind of backdrop or the perfect era to set this in. And and it was very clear that like the Cromwellian invasion was perfect in that way because it had this huge environmental destruction. But I think if you're going to set any story in Ireland, uh, any time between like 1100 and uh, the early 1900s, it's going to be against the backdrop of English occupation, unfortunately. I like said, uh, you know, do you remember my idea that the three movies are the three D's of Ireland? The church, depression, and the English. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the aesthetics of Wolf Walker. So there's sort of two worlds in the film. One is the town, which is fortified. Um, you know, it's it's got big walls and is, you know, itself almost prison-like. And... The forest, which is, you know, there's like a little no man's land and then there's a there's a forest and they look very different. Could you describe the ways that you represent the town and the ways that you represent the the forest just visually? Well, I suppose um, when Tom and myself were coming up with the story, we we we're both, you know, visual artists primarily. So. 
like when we come up with stories we're immediately thinking of like epic moments and and illustrating them as soon as possible you know so we were putting pen to paper as we were coming up with the initial ideas uh, of the story and i think from a from an art direction and from a visual development point of view we were both very much on the same page that we would do everything we could possibly do to reinforce the idea that uh, this little kid is under you know lock and key and under orders and there are so many rules and they're not allowed to do what what they want to do so really the 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 town should be almost like a cage to them and we'd play around with perspective we'd like you know make it like a maze we'd avoid showing the the sky if we could like always make it seem like that he or she is trapped by buildings and trapped by the the rules of the Lord Protector and then of course when they go out into the forest it has to be the polar opposite it has to be like really really open deep place um you know and lots of curves lines uh um to kind of emphasize this energy that flows through the landscape whereas the the city is quite dead and cold and austere the forest is alive and kind of brimming with energy and a real like lush opulent place um so like tom himself would have started that visual development alongside the script for a couple of years but then we got amazing concept artists like Cyril Pedrosa and Emily Hughes and then our scene illustration team on board. And they they like consistently upped the game each time. Every time we got a new artist in, they, they would bring new ideas and fresh ideas. And I think like what you see on screen is the result of like, you know, many, many artists uh, contributing to that visual language. Yeah, it was very collaborative, but I think we were pretty clear from the start, like the kind of you know, we're very like after three movies now or two at the time, we kind of had learned a lot about how visual language could be used. And I think really early on on Secret of Kells, before we got into production, we were just trying out stuff because it looked cool. And over the years, we've been focusing more and more. How can we use all the the tricks and tips from, you know, illustration, comic books or whatever to help the narrative? So I think we were trying to be use everything that hand drawn animation could do to be as expressive as possible for the characters and what was going on for the characters um, rather than just pure like kind of world building because it looked cool. It kind of had to have a psychological kind of meaning to it or something. Yeah, maybe when we came out of college at the very start, we would have been just trying out cool things because it looked cool. But whereas in Wolf Walkers, we wanted everything to serve the story and the mood as much as possible. One of the things that struck me about the way the film looks is that there are sequences that play, you know, visually almost as, as two dimensionally as, you know, a shadow puppet or something. And there are sequences that have a sense, a sense of three dimensionality and depth that, you know, you almost never see in hand drawn animation where usually it's a you know a character in the foreground moving a, across a, a static background so tell me a little bit about what kind of choices you make and how you make the choices about you know the way the metaphorical camera works when you're drawing the pictures you know the way you represent depth of field and flatness and um you know, the sense of space on screen. Yeah, there's a certain amount of it that you can pre-plan and discuss. And we make charts like there's a guy, Bruce Block, who wrote a book called the Visual Story. And he discusses, you know, how much animation is freer to do this than any other medium. How deep do you want the, the canvas to be at one point? How flat do you want it to be? How much shape language do you want to use? But there is an, another aspect of it that's a bit like, you know, dancing about architecture to talk about. So a lot of it is like visual experimentation with each other and um, making Ross and I would make like little director's brief notes for the storyboarders with a lot of ideas that could be just location, tone and mood, what the characters are feeling could also be these kind of design ideas. So broadly speaking, we wanted to play with that two and a half D forced kind of almost Escher like perspective in the woodcut, the woodcut style of the town. And in the forest, we wanted to go deeper and looser with the brushstrokes. And then for the wolf vision, when you're actually seeing the world through the eyes of the wolves, we wanted that to be a roller coaster ride that we hadn't really done before. So we knew that had to have that Z axis that had to be moving through space in a 
you know, like the speeder bikes in Return of the Jedi or something, you know, it had to be like really dynamic and exciting. So those were broadly, I mean, it doesn't like saying all that is one thing, actually figuring out how it would look on screen really came from kind of a workshop feeling with a lot of the artists just trying different stuff out and us saying, yeah, that, that feels right for that moment, you know. There are sequences in the film where we see things through the eyes of the wolves. I mean, it's a movie about a kid who transforms into a wolf. Can you smell me? <laughs> of course, everybody can. <laughs> well, close your eyes. Don't need your eyes to see. And you can hear every little thing that moves. And your paws can hear through the earth. We have four legs now. You can run really fast and jump so high. Hey, wait for me. Keep your nose down. Be a wolf. I was like completely transported by them. They're so extraordinary because they, you know, without being really literal, they kind of represent the way a wolf experiences the world, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, a narrowed color palette and, you know, seeing through smell and and almost seeing through the relationship to the other wolves in the pack. And it's like sort of abstract. And like I said, I was totally mesmerized by it. And then later when I was thinking back on it, I was like, wow, it would have been so easy for that to be corny and lame. <laughs> and <laughs> like, I wonder if you're like, but if you're taking as big a bite of the apple as that, is there a part of you that's like, oh man, if we draw smells, we could really step in it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I think we both had a lot of faith. Like we had great collaborators like Evan McNamara, who took on those sequences. He kind of knew what we were going for. And we had done a test pretty early on even concept art i don't think we ever were afraid of drawing smells i guess cartoons are just pepe le pew or whatever it's it's okay <laughs> but, um, but but it, but it's a good point though because if it had ended up like a pepe le pew type thing it would have completely it would have caused the audience to laugh instead of like be transported so it is a gamble i think like you know um anytime you you have a a, a vision for what you might want to end up on screen um you are taking a gamble that like you've got it, hopefully you've got it right. And like the worst thing would be for your audience to start laughing in the wrong places. And I think like we both had experiences, smaller experiences of that on Secret of Kells and, and less, oh, yeah. less, lesser extent of the song of the sea. The first time you sit down with your audience and you're watching the audience more than the film and you're watching, you know, if they laugh in the right places and inevitably there will be a few things where they laugh in the wrong places and you kind of cringe at that. I feel like the technology really informs what's on the screen as well. I've like I have young kids and have watched so many both good and bad animated movies in the past uh, five years or so. And one of the things that struck me particularly about um, uh, computer animated movies is often the computer animated movies from fifteen and twenty years ago look better than the ones from now they obviously look you know lower tech they look blockier and they are you know the water looks weirder but sometimes i'll I'll watch a big studio computer animated film even now and i kind of think like i feel like they put all this stuff on the screen because they just could make as many little guys to be in the background as they wanted mm, <laughs> like they mm. had 700 little guy animators yeah. in a computer that could yeah. animate 700 little guys so every screen has 700 yeah. guys in the background and in a film like wolf walkers like you can have you know only a certain number of things on the screen and it forces you to make choices about the design of every frame that i feel like get punted sometimes in even good big computer animated movies we had like a a definite example of that one time when we were when we were having uh, these backgrounds in the forest and um the comp team the compositing team had an option to add in like 
leaves uh you know dropping down from the trees and like this kind of dust and haze in the air and like they they you know with they worked on nuke so nuke could do all that stuff and so they did a couple of test scenes of all these things all these particles and everything like that and like it looked it looked cool but it didn't suit the whole aesthetic of wolfwalkers that we were going for this kind of storybook um aesthetic so so we in the end we we got them to take out everything except maybe one or two little leaves dropping down and we depended on the sound design to create the whole atmosphere of a forest in the background. Um, so really, I, th I think like it's like what you say, if we had put all the bells and whistles in there in the background, it would have it would have completely jarred with the whole storybook aesthetic of Wolfwalkers, you know. So really, like the visual, the visual style that you aim for at the start of the project kind of is the thing that should steer all of those decisions. So, yeah, we don't have 700 little guys in the background. Your studio has made a series of spectacularly beautiful and artistically successful films, in my opinion. I'm not asking you to stipulate to that. And uh, we agree. I wonder. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I wonder if you still have to live with the pressure that, you know, if if one of the movies doesn't work, whether you will ever be able to put the pieces back together to continue in your, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> chosen yeah. career and life. Yeah, yeah, we could have to get those real jobs eventually. Yeah, if we break, I know we didn't want to break the the good streak. I hear drums. That's my daughter dancing immediately above my office. And awesome. <laughs> Um, I suppose Tom himself even had that pressure, like uh, when we were making Wolfwalkers. If this, if this, like if Wolfwalkers doesn't get nominated for an Oscar, I suppose we'd be the first to break that streak of Oscar-nominated features from Cartoon Saloon. So fingers crossed, you know. So don't break the streak, Academy <laughs> voters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that I think I think we have a good. I think we'd have a little bit of like professional armor or resilience now because we have. Um, built up the studio to the point where there's a decent amount of projects going through that like it used to be really sink or swim that we we lived or died based on each project and the company was always kind of teetering on the edge of going bust from project to project where now I think we kind of have gotten to a healthy point where we've three big projects on the go at the same time and that gives us a little bit more leg room to be a bit more um, experimental in the kind of flagship stuff that we do and kind of push it out a little bit because we at least we have you know some tv shows and stuff in production that hopefully will carry the studio through if the features don't work but i think we have to be careful as well not to get too afraid and become like kind of caricatures of ourselves or beating ourselves for fear of going in the wrong direction i think it's good to stay brave and try different stuff and trust different directors and stuff to keep the studio kind of interesting well tom and ross i really appreciate you taking this time to come on the show um and thanks for for the movie which is really uh, an extraordinary achievement i mean it is a fantastic fantastic movie and i really mean that. Oh, thank you so much that means a lot thank you very much tom moore and ross stewart as i have been saying wolf walkers is an absolutely spectacular movie look i'm not the kind of guy who tells grown-ups to watch animated movies because they're art too or whatever but if you have children you will love this movie, and if you do not have children, you will love this movie. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created in the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California, where my son this week figured out that to get his car to do the loop-to-loop, -loop, he's got to make the track a little shorter. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio and Jordan Cowling are our associate producers. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Thanks very much to them and to their label, Memphis Industries, for sharing it with us. You can also keep up with the show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We post all our interviews there. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.